Oops, there we go. And then if the committee chair, Liza Hickey, um, we'll let Jennifer take notes. Yeah, she's but taking notes. Yeah, if you want to help us start the meeting and do introductions, that would be great. Sure. Here's our little. This is Erica. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Liza Hickey. That's Jennifer Jacobson Wood. <laughs> and we'll just go from there. John Sears, Cambridge Public Library. Welcome back, John. <laughs> Katie Morrow, Morton Public Library. Robert Morgan, Delivery Service Manager, EPRA. Martha Troxell, RSA. Patty Clarum, RSA. Rhonda Beerman, RSA. Okay. Let's see if we can read who's online. Do you want to switch spots with me? Or Probably okay? should. Okay. Although you have to tell me where. I'll chime in with the library. Yeah. <laughs> Our usual. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Now for the butchering of names. Uh, Lindsay Nichol, Carthage Public Library. Abby Miles, Brimfield Public Library. Uh, Amy Gould, uh, Kiwani Public Library. Carla. Ainsley. Ainsley. Macomb Public Library. Uh, Jennifer Schott, Peoria Public. Good. Uh, <laughs> Julia Cozad Callahan, Normal Public Library. Um, Megan Rowe, Galesburg Public Library. Nancy Turpening, Galesburg Public Library. Becky Partee, Peoria Public Library. <laughs> Rebecca Seaborn, Farmington Public Library. And Rhonda Beerman, who's here. Chat monitor. And don't forget Uzma. Oh, Uzma Salute, <coughs> Normal Public Library. Okay, I think that's it. Excellent. Yay. Let's okay. get out of the way now. <laughs> we have had several staff changes here in our building, both for delivery and for RSA. So Kendall is going to give us an introduction and then we'll have the new staff come up and give give little introductions of themselves as well. All right. So first off uh, we have a new cataloging and database coordinator uh, who is in the room. So if the new cataloging and the database coordinator, Rhonda Beerman, could say a few words, that would be fabulous. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, as you know, I've been with RSA for the last six years, and um, I knew it was time. I needed to move up and do real cataloging. <laughs> So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, training and further helping you guys with cataloging your class and eventually brief records visits. Those will be fun too. Looking forward to all of it. Congratulations, Rhonda. We're fortunate. And as you can imagine, since Rhonda has moved up, that means her former position, the catalog, the let's see. Cataloging coordinator. That was the senior cataloging and database specialist position. Is currently open. We're accepting applications through Friday. I have no idea how many we currently have because uh, I haven't asked. It's been a busy week, uh, but uh, we'll be taking a look at those probably starting Monday to do interviews. I think the week after that is when we were planning on trying to do interviews. We also have a new senior member services specialist. That would be Patty, I'm going to ruin her last name, mm -hmm. Quirum. Very good. Was that right? That was right. That's fair. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That bodes well. Um, hi, I'm Patty Quirum. I worked uh, over seven years at Washington District Library with Lori and staff and just started here at the end of August. I think I'm the new Amanda is, but I didn't know Amanda, so. Um, <laughs> so I'm the new Amanda and um, I will be doing, staffing the RSA help desk uh, with workflows questions and troubleshooting and system operations. I will be doing site visits to libraries, doing uh, surf training, host training, new, uh, new director training, and hopefully, possibly we conducting training program. like what Martha's been doing. Depending on Martha's replacement, I might be doing the CERT training and hold training here. Um, I'll be doing updating um, maybe workflow cheat sheets that are on the support site and uh, 
uh, maybe some workflows, maintenance, and um, customization. So call me at the help desk <laughs> or email, and I will be happy to help you. And I'm I'm very excited to have this new career opportunity here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, oh, I can't hand this out. Um, I'm oh, going to yeah, hand go this out while Bob, Bob while you're coming up. Us. We did revise our contact list. I know we still have an open position, but Kendall revised our staff contact list, so I thought I'd give you a copy. There's extras, so I'll leave the the extras in the back of the room if you want more than one. We also have uh, Russ has changed his status with Rails. Uh, he's in the partial retirement mode working towards full retirement, uh, which means we need to have a, a, a new person there. So Bob uh, Morgan is the, what is your official title? Interim delivery services manager or just delivery services manager? I'm going to say both right now because I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> um, and I, I say that I'm not sure because they, they've told me on the delivery service manager over the phone, but they've also put it in writing as interim. Uh, and I will go into detail about that uh, in the sense that when I was put into this position, it was under the terms of six months. They're going to uh, give me a trial run, and at the end of the six months, they will evaluate uh, myself and see how how I'm doing. Uh, so hopefully, and I, I can say in confidence that they're not going to have to search for anybody else because I can do this job rather well. Uh, so uh, I am the interim delivery service manager. Uh, so any time you've contacted Russ, uh, you can use the same modes of communication to contact if you have any questions or problems. Um, however, uh, there are phone number changes. I have temporary business cards to hand out um, with an updated office phone number. We've changed that from a local area code to a 630 number from up in Burr Ridge. Uh, so you can use the old number that you used for Russ for his office number, which was a 7, 740-3558. Uh, you can use that number and it will automatically reroute to the new number. Uh, but you have to dial obviously the full number with, with including the area code. So um, obviously the emails changed, um, most of the emails through RSA and um, uh, Rails, they're all uh, usually a first name, last name. It's the same thing with, with, with mine, it's Robert.Morgan. Again, I put that on the business card as well. Uh, so any questions, any problems? Uh, please feel free. Um, I've already had several libraries giving me plenty of challenges to face, and I appreciate that because it keeps me in check and it keeps me uh, challenged to do this job. So I encourage you to uh, don't hesitate to bring those challenges to me, bring those problems to me, and uh, we'll get them solved. Um, there's currently a few changes happening in our, in our delivery department. Um, we're focusing on getting a couple new vehicles. Um, and we're also focusing on uh, moving the routes around a little bit, changing some things, uh, just fine-tuning some things right now. So, um, again, any problems or concerns, please, 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 I can't stress enough, please call me. Uh, email me, whatever whatever it is you need to do to get your problems taken care of. I'm here, and I'm excited for it. So, <laughs> so I'm going to hand these out as they continue on with the next agenda item. All right. Thank you. Can we have a few of those too? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And I apologize, they're not the greatest. Again, they haven't given me, we're, we're still in this process. They haven't given me actual business cards yet. So they're not, they're not, they're not, they're not in the greatest condition, but they're, they're something. So the other thing to know is that we are kind of at the, in the midst of making a phone swap over uh, for all of the local numbers, but not for the 800 number. Um, late last year, we actually started removing the local phone numbers off of our website and out of our documentation and probably eventually off of our business cards once we all have new telephone numbers um, because we we want you calling the, the 866 number, 866-940-4083 um, um, is the help desk that rings on everybody's desk. So it's not luck of the draw whether Kendall's in his office and you get the phone picked up. It's if somebody's in the office, there's a pretty good chance we're going to pick the phone up because everybody's phone is ringing. Um, so eventually we're all going to have Burr Ridge numbers, and that's just basically a cost savings thing um, because we're paying for individual copper lines down here. 
when Burr Ridge has unlimited service through their phones, and that just doesn't make a ton of sense. So um, that uh, toll-free help desk number will always stay the same. So just please call that, uh, and it'll get to us. Can I add one thing, Kendall? Go ahead. Um, the, uh, you, you started touching on the opportunities available with the new position changes. Uh, my old position, I used to be a sorter. I'm sorry, I didn't elaborate on that. Um, that position is now open and it will be open until the 25th. At that point, we will also be uh, conducting interviews, most likely, I'm on the same boat as you, probably the week after, um, is what I'm being told. So um, if you do know of anybody, um, or if any of you are interested, or whatever, um, please send them our way. It's on the website. Um, you can follow the links to uh, under at the bottom for job opportunities uh, for that. So we are looking and uh, we're eager to find someone new. So, <laughs> Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, we also have one other open, not open yet. It's a it's a new hire in RSA. That is the member services supervisor position. Um, this will be uh, well, not the new Martha. It, w it will be a person doing the same job as Martha because I'm not sure we can have a new Martha. Um, so we did interviews. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did interviews all day Monday. And when I say all day, we walk someone in, walk the next person out and immediately grab the next person in and did that all day Monday. So we had four exceedingly well qualified candidates. Um, so we talked just very briefly Monday. We talked Tuesday. We talked yesterday. We'll probably talk again today. <laughs> this is a, it's a nice problem to have um, when we're looking at people who interviewed and going, hmm, uh, positives, negatives, lots of positives, lots of positives. What do we, what? It's a great problem to have because normally you guys, if you've ever sat in an interview, usually by the end of the interview, you're like, okay, we have one person and that's it. Let's hope they say yes. Um, the, the HR person who did the interviews with us at the end of the meeting was like, I've never sat in a group of interviews where I felt like everybody could do the job and everybody would be good at it. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's going to take us a little while to fill this position. Um, but once we know um, who it's going to be, um, we'll put some information out on the website or out via email. Um, we're hoping to have someone on hand around the middle of October, so that they can get a good two and a half months of overlap with Martha um, to, to get uh, Martha's brain dump, um, <laughs> go out and do a couple member visits with Martha, that kind of thing, um, to, to kind of get them a little bit prepared for what's coming. Uh, there's a lot coming, um, but uh, that'll at least get them a little bit prepared. So um, we'll be making an announcement about that when we have an announcement to make. Uh, and that also means that, unfortunately, Martha is going to retire on us here at the end of the year. Martha has worked for RSA since October 5th of 1999. Yes. Martha's been with us for a long, long time. <laughs> <laughs> so, we have a large cookie for Martha. That is in the back of the room, so be sure to help yourself. Um, Martha started here doing like circulation help, cataloging help, parameters. There was four staff members in RSA, and Martha did lots of stuff. And when I got here, Martha was a great help um, and has been basically from the time I walked in the door in 2005 up until now, and I'm going to miss her a lot when she leaves. Um, but uh, we're, we're super excited for her to take her next step um, because, you know, you work all your life. You want to do some fun stuff. But we will certainly miss her quite a lot when she goes. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a happy thing and a sad thing. All right. On to potentially more happier news. Um, on the back table, although oh, it's not nearly as one. exciting. Did I? Yeah. Where did I skip? 
<laughs> I didn't put it in red. <laughs> the... We're circulating a card right now for Martha. Oh. If you want to sign it and, and have a short message, if you'd like, that way she'll have a keepsake of her last database meeting. Um, <laughs> I know she's probably so sad, <laughs> but we're going to miss her. And I know for me, she's really been a, a wonderful mentor and really helped me get to where I am here in RSA. So I'm okay. going to miss her a, a lot. But like Kendall said, this retirement is much deserved, Martha. <laughs> All right, yes, I did miss something. Um, so Rails has a central cataloging, centralized cataloging coordinator position that I believe they're still in the process of hiring someone for. Mm -hmm. This person is going to do, well, if you read the job interview that was posted, or the job everything. ad that was posted <laughs> on the Rails website, everything is exactly right. Um, I think they're going to start off working on the, there was some, um, Erica was on a subcommittee, and Liza, and Liza as well, um, to come up with some cataloging standards uh, for Rails libraries. And I think that's going to be kind of the first point of emphasis, mm -hmm. is trying to, to get some of those out. Um, if, you, if you're in a consortia, you have to have standards. Um, if you're in a standalone library, sometimes they, you know, the standard is whatever they put in their catalog. Um, but that does cause problems if you then wanted to turn around and join like the Find More Illinois Overlay Project, which is now just at the part where they're going to start taking new libraries. Um, because if you've cataloged things your own unique, unique way, and then you join an overlay consortia, your own unique records are still going to be own and unique while, but now combined with everybody else's. So um, we're not sure who the new person will be or when they'll start sometime this year, I'm sure. Um, but uh, we're, we're excited to see what that position is going to get to do. And I'm hoping too, once we know who it is, I plan to invite them to one of these meetings if they're able to travel. So. I'd like to work with this person because I think there's very much a need, like Kendall said, for um, cataloging best practices. I know we have our own, but again, we can use use help and as well with training. Um, I know they've talked about this position doing training for cataloging staff of various levels across the system. So like Kendall said, we're really interested to see how this position plays out and, and I'd like to work with the person in terms of our operations. All right, um, on the back table, there is uh, an RSA infographic. Um, you can grab one and pick it up on the way out. It's also on um, the RSA website, on the About RSA page, um, where there's three of the four panels are here. Um, the fourth panel is basically this map with a link to contact your library. Um, so it's got um, some stats on how many members are in RSA, what types of libraries are in RSA, the thing that surprises everybody, which is population served of our public libraries. We have 42 public libraries that serve under 2,500 people. If you're one of those libraries, you're, you know that's true. Uh, but, and, and then we have another 24 or 25 libraries that serve between 2,500 and 5,000. That, that is a mind-boggling number to the folks in the Chicago area libraries who don't understand how you can have a library that serves 538 people, which is what our smallest automated library serves. They, that 538 people is like their friends group or something. They just don't understand how that works. So um, this has uh, the population served, it's got our school enrollment numbers, and then the FY18, now that the fiscal year is done, uh, July to June, um, title counts, item counts, total CERC, transits, reciprocal borrowers, holds, patron counts, that kind of thing. So it's just something interesting. Um, I, I think not RSA libraries, even our members don't really understand just how many small libraries we have sometimes. So it's kind of eye-opening to see it kind of just charted out on a, on a simple to use little graph. So um, you can download this if you want. It comes in a PDF format. It's all lined up. So if you print it, it's front back um, on a two page and it, you know, whatever. 
Oh, um, good. You moved the download link. I to moved the, the top. download okay, link, good. so it's findable. <laughs> Thank you, Erica. Uh, the download link used to be below that, the whole big long infographic. Um, so that is out on our website. I believe it's also on um, all of, it might be on your website as well. Let's, let's take a look, shall we? We'll do the tab and go. Every, everybody's uh, RSA cat page has uh, an about RSA link on it. Ah, and I put that there as well. And it also has the, the map, um, and it also has kind of just an overview of the, the stats, just a little bit better. That um, The only thing different about the RSA page is that I put the infographic on, on the page for everybody. Um, all right. So I wanted to give you some a quick RSA cat upgrade uh, updates. So I'll use the CHMB, the typical Harry Potter search. So we we discovered an issue um, uh, with uh, with uh, normal actually is the one who pointed this out where they had looked at an item in RSA cat and for whatever reason. And I'm, I'm not sure the, the genesis of this, but there was an item in RSA CAT, and then they modified the item, and they went back and looked at it in RSA CAT, and it was not modified yet, right? So we'll take this uh, this DVD here. So they found it, they something was incorrect, or they added something to it. They went back and looked at it, and it wasn't modified. And we thought, all right, well, it probably hasn't been indexed yet. We do an index at the top of every hour, but it takes 30 to 40 minutes before that whole indexing process is done. If you've missed the start of that indexing process, like you modify a record at, say, 10.02, well, the process kicked off at 10 o'clock. So now you have to wait for the 11 o'clock process before it gets picked up, and then it's going to be about 11.30 or 11.40 before those changes would show in RSA CAT. And this is for bibliographic changes to the description. So Correct. not your item level call number changes, this is changes to the record. Yes, So because the item stuff is all pulled back in real right. time. Location, item status, that all comes back in real time. But the actual bib record, that has to be indexed. And what they found was they, they waited like two hours and they went and looked at the record and the changes hadn't been made. So they called us, we pull the records up and we're like, I see the changes, what's, you know. So then we're confused because they could not see the changes, we could see the changes, we started playing. And if we had looked at a record, you couldn't see the changes, but if you changed something and then pulled the record up, you could see the changes. So of course we open a case with um, Cersei Dynix and it turns out there's some caching that goes on on the servers to speed up searching. And so there was like a six hour timeout in this cache. So if you waited six hours and didn't look at the page, then it would update the, the page on the server. But if you had not looked at the page or you went through it through a different RSA cat profile page, you could see the update, it was very odd. So anyway, we've, we've gotten Cersei to lower that caching time. So hopefully, Hopefully, if you notice this, it will not take six hours. It should just be a couple of hours now before everything gets wiped out and shows up again. So we had that we had never seen that. It was new to us. I don't know if any of you guys have noticed it, but um, if you are modifying items and you look at the item and you modify it and then you go back and look at it, just be aware that there is a cache period in there and it might take a couple of hours before your bib record uh, changes up here. Thank you to Normal for pointing that out because like Kendall said, we did not know about this bug as I called it. Um, so it, it does help when you see things like this to let us know that way we can look further if we need to and then bring it to the larger group if somebody else might have the same trouble. Some things are bugs and some things are features. That was a feature. Oh, it which was a appeared, feature? It's a feature <laughs> because it speeds up searching. Oh, so right. it's a feature okay. that appears like a bug. All right. Um, I just want to let everybody know if you haven't seen in, in like the uh, RSA, say the RSA reports, 
um, or maybe didn't see it at um, users group, there is an RSA demo profile. If you replace your um, library name in your in your um, RSA cat page with RSA demo, or you just go to the RSA website, there's a link right there to the RSA demo profile right here in the uh, quick links. If you go out here, this has got all of the stuff we're playing with uh, in the catalog, as well as things that we have rolled out that you may or may not have turned on in your catalog. Um, on the front page, there are um, things, uh, beta testing development enhancements that are currently live on this page um, with kind of an overview of what's happening with them. And then at the bottom, there are RSA CAT enhancements that are in production and ready to go. Um, and so it'll tell you like customized search tab results with the three search tabs on top of the searches that's available now for full and basic members. A lot of the schools don't have this turned on, so they didn't, don't even know it exists really. So they could come out and see this. Um, allowing your patrons to change their email address or their telephone address inside of RSA CAT is live now. But again, if you didn't see that in, um, users group or in the documentation that came out after users group, you may not know that. That is turned on in this account. Um, basically, you can come here and go, oh, here's something maybe I missed or here's what are they playing with now. This RSA demo page will have all of that uh, up and running. And if you look at the front page, it'll tell you where we're at with it. And if it's ready to go, you can just open a ticket with the help desk and we'll turn it on for you. Um, we'll do another Harry Potter chamber search. Right now, the big one that's operating on this page that kind of affects how things are laid out uh, is the Ferber searching, um, which basically looks at the title and the authors. And if it has the same title field and the same authors, it's going to combine all of those records, whether it's a book or a movie or a DVD or an audiobook or whatever. Um, so. The tip off to that is up here in the search results. It says some results may be grouped and there's a little chain. It's hard to see. Let me get bigger. There's a little chain with a break thing, a little link you can break that would actually turn this off. If we scroll down here, notice these results up here, they tell you how many we have, what the format is. These results down here have a very light highlighting over them and they don't tell you how many are there. That's because it's taken a whole bunch of different records and combined it under one um, hit. So a patron would go, oh, well, Harry Potter and Chamber of Secrets, that's what I want. This one's got Blu-rays, VHSs, DVDs, books, books on CD, and books on cassette all underneath it. Um, you can see how many of them are available by clicking on them. This is kind of in the middle. What we would what we would like is if you click on this one that says Blu-ray, it only would open the two Blu-ray results. That's currently not how it works. So because RSA, because we let you catalog things basically however you want, as far as item types go, so that your items circulate the correct way, it breaks the Ferber functionality in the default widget. So we had to rewrite the default widget to make it work with RSA's catalog enhancements, but it doesn't quite work the way we want. So we're going to rethink it a little bit and then have to recode it from scratch. But this is something that's coming. It'll be nice when it does come. Um, I'm hoping to make it optional so a patron has to turn it on rather than it being <coughs> by default. But for things like this, I think it'll be real helpful. So um, if we can make it work the way we want it to work, then we would make it live. If we can't make it to work the way we want it to work, then we'll probably have it just kind of off to the side, um, but not someplace that patrons would find in your normal catalog. And this will be reworked based off of item category three, correct? That's the plan okay. now, yeah. And while I'm in here, because this is something that I, a lot of people have asked for over the years, um, so in your My Account, um, if you want to allow patrons to change their phone numbers and email addresses, this is an option now. You'll notice this account has it turned on, 
So there's an edit button. It shows me these are the three fields that I can edit. If I go through and edit one of these and hit save, it writes it to my account and workflows. If you want that turned on, great. If you don't want it turned on, we don't have to turn it on. This is RSA CAP profile specific. No, it's 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 those three things, and those are the only things we can turn on and off. And that that part is system wide. The the question was for those online, um, if you can just turn on parts of this account to be edited in RSA CAD and, and like Kendall said, it's all or nothing. Email. Yeah. email address and phone number. Oh, sorry. No, it's email address and phone number only. There's also there's also a report that you can get that shows what was edited in RSA CAT and the patron ID. So if you if you wanted to see, there not a ton of patrons use this, but if you wanted to see, hey, did a patron edit something in their account? We have a report that'll show what things were edited and what they were edited to. I don't believe the report shows what they were pre-edit, but it shows what they are post-edit. So you'll know, hey, uh, the patron changed this thing rather than we changed that thing. Um, you don't want to know how long it took to make that report work because it was a long time. Um, so it's as pretty as it's going to be, and it's not real pretty, but it does show uh, what patrons edit, edited. Online, uh, so if the patron enters a phone number incorrectly for format, such as period instead of hyphen, will the system fix that so just a bit check Does it still work in the future? I believe the answer is no. Ah. Oh, good. It won't take it. <laughs> so there is, okay. Oh, it's the email address. So, so on phone numbers, this is how it's going to tell you that it wants things to be added if it's not in this format. So let me read. Which, if I remember right, when we were looking at this, it's not really the way that we the format that we use, right? Because it shows parentheses around the area. So. Yeah, and I thought we fixed that. In fact, I think we did fix that. I thought it was something that we couldn't. No, we figured out how to fix that. I'm, I was pretty sure mm -hmm. we did. Yeah, see, because I just entered it exactly how they told me. Has it been six hours yet? <laughs> it has not been six hours yet. It's an enhancement of six hours, remember? <laughs> hmm. Well, now I have to go back and look at that. <laughs> Did you want to show the cross-reference oh, searching for names yes. and subject headings? So the other thing that we have, um, and this is not on the demo site because I just haven't had time to uh, get it over there yet. Um, this is the newest thing we had seriously cook up. It's cross-reference searching. It is probably far more handy for you as staff than for patrons for most things. But uh, so we could do a cross-reference search in the subject field for we'll do global warming because why not? <laughs> so system-wide, here are our records for this. For global warming, um, we have a corporate name. There's a corporate name for that? Oh, a House, House Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming. Imagine that. Um, we have greenhouse effects with a, another subject term, economic aspects, prevention. I'm going to guess that there are records for that. Yes, there are. Here are 39 records. Um, so these. Uh, I think are going to be far more helpful to staff than anybody else. Um, they do once, if you just do a search without using one of the cross-reference uh, indexes, if there are uh, cross-reference uh, records in our authority file, they show up at the very end of the search because they have no relevance to the search. And you know, the this thing searches by relevance, right? So the cross-reference hits don't have any quote unquote relevance. Um, they're not title records, so they can't have relevance. So they would show up at the very last things, uh, which is a little tip. So 
if I just did a regular all field search for just plain old global warming, and then I go to the very last page of results, I would assume that here they that's where they would show up. Is that the last page? That is the last page. Oh, but I also need, I think, to be in the all libraries catalog. Yeah. You ha also have to be in the all RSA libraries catalog because that's who owns the authorities, is none of your individual libraries own an authority, so they only show up in the all RSA search. But they show up, they're the last hits that show up on a search. So it's either the last page or the page before the last page, more than likely, where they would show up. Let's see, did I get any mixed here? This you think no. we could roll out, correct? This, the, this can be rolled out sooner okay. than the Ferber. Yeah, this is pretty much ready to go. I just need to clean it up a little bit and make it work. With the, there's, this is all set up on a test instance. It's indexing all of our authorities and then doing a lot of work in the background, but it's, all, it's set up only on this profile, and I need to convert everything over and probably two days of work to get it working. So I just haven't had two days to do it. All right. I think that is all. That's on my list. Anybody have any questions for me? Gonna run away then. Thank you, Kendall. Run away, run away. <laughs> okay. I did post like we do for these meetings, um, the meeting resources that we're going to be looking at today. So when we're on the RSA support site, remember the shortcut link is rsanfp.com. It takes you here. We have in our navigation menu on the left, RSA board, committees, groups, and then the DB database management committee. We'll go to the bottom. Okay, a couple of these we've talked about, the revised contact list, the infographic, the demo profile. I wanted to ask the group because I wasn't in the room part of the time, but remember in May, the Cataloging Maintenance Center, the CMC staff visited, did they give give you guys these contact cards? And I'll open the link here for those online. Did they give you these? Okay. It looks familiar. It looks familiar. Okay. I have a stack of them to pass around. And those online, you're welcome to print this if it'd be helpful to keep handy. Um, do you want to hand these out for me, Liza? Thank you. I think Rails sent us the cards we had at our office. I, I don't remember getting them when the CMC came, but that's good to know most of you don't have them. Remember, this service specializes in local history, genealogy. I know several of you in the room have used it, so I'm and online too, so I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, but they have this new contact card because they have a new preferred phone number. Notice it's on the, the back of the card. Um, it's the 618-656 Thank you. 3216 extension 503. It used to be the contact number for Vince Andrzejewski, um, but since there's a couple different staff members now at the Cataloging Maintenance Center doing cataloging, this is more of a generic number. And then they do have a new email address as well. Um, and it's not on the card. Thank you, Rhonda. Yes. Yeah, so if you could write on your card or, or make a note. Um, the email address is cmc at illinoisheartland.org. So cmc at illinoisheartland.org. And Illinois Heartland is one word. There's no period or hyphen. So if you're thinking of submitting something, remember, reach out to the CMC first, and, and you can use either that generic email or the generic phone. Um, and then you'll probably talk to either Vince or Sherry. They seem to be the two doing the, the most um, special collections cataloging. Okay. The 
The other thing I wanted to mention about the Cataloging Maintenance Center, you might have seen these, and I know a couple of you attended the first one. You might have seen in the Rails e-newsletter that the Cataloging Maintenance Center is doing a series of webinars on various cataloging-related topics. Um, so I think I'll have you, Liza, again, you can be my, my hander-outer. Um, usually we look at this supervisor's report last, but I thought I'd go ahead and share it because towards the end of the document, I went ahead and listed these CMC webinars, the dates, the times, in case um, you're interested in attending them. So let me open that online. Okay, I'm gonna go clear down in the document. So let's see here. Okay, it looks like it's page four, and I realize I didn't put page numbers on it, so I do apologize for that. Thank you. So notice I've, I've put here um, several upcoming professional development related to cataloging. All of it's free, all of it's online, um, but the CMC ones, they have webinars. Um, they did one last month on weeding. That, that was a really good discussion. Um, lots of input, different perspectives, different sizes of libraries. I know Carla from Macomb was, was on that webinar. Um, they're doing several of these, like I said, September all the way through January. So I've put the different topics there. Um, the next few look like they focus on specific fields in the MARC bibliographic record, but they do have one in January about the future of cataloging. Um, these webinars, they start with a brief introduction to the, the topic, and then there's time for discussion with the presenter and attendees. So they're, they're trying to make these interactive on various topics. Even though they're the CMC doing them, anybody in Rails is welcome to attend them. So be sure if, if there's even other staff at your library that might be interested who aren't here today, feel free to share these webinars. And then keep an eye on the Rails e-newsletter, too, because they do an, a little article about these when there's one coming up. Okay, any questions about those? Erica? Mm -hmm. um, this first one says that it's a live webinar, and then the other one, the else say live. Are they going to be archived, and you can go back and look at it at any time, or does it have to be on that day? That's a good question. For those online, um, Lori from Washington asked if the first webinar in particular, because it says American Libraries Live, um, if it's going to be archived, as well as the rest of these webinars, if they're going to be archived. Yes, I actually know that first one certainly is, because we internally, the cataloging team here, we're going to watch it, but Lisa on our team isn't here, so we're going to wait until she gets back to watch it, and I did sign up for it so I can get notification when the recording's ready. Um, the the cataloging maintenance center ones, yes, they're recording those as well. I'm not sure if they're publicly posted on the Heartland Library System site, though, because I know I got the recording from the first one, the weeding one, but I registered for it. So I'm not sure if they have them publicly posted, but that's something that if you're interested in that one, I'm sure Heartland would be glad to help you get access to the recordings. Um, and then this other one that I found, and this one I, I just found, um, I want to say by happenstance, I, I wasn't looking for it, but I was reading something else. Um, the Texas State Library does webinars, and it looks like anybody can register. They have one coming up next week that sounds really interesting about ditching Dewey. I'm not sure if they archive there, so that, that's one I'm not sure about, um, but most of these here should be archived. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Okay, we are going to switch seats, Rhonda and I. She is going to go over a few things next on the agenda. Are you good with the posters? Do I need to be Vanna White? <laughs> no, I'm good with the You're good. Poster. Okay. First, pull up this picture. All right, for our 
staff and service day, they asked at all departments to make an easy way to explain what your department does. So Lisa and I decided we were going to make a really dumbed down version of what cataloging is. We wanted to make it as simple as possible to explain what it is we do every day. And so, as you can see, um, we named, like, this is a book, and so that's a jumble of information that we then take using cataloging magic and then put it into what is a cataloging record. And then we import it into workflows. So this is what the um, you, the staff, sees. And then what's in workflows is what the patron sees on the catalog. So it's basically just a very, like I said, it's easy to understand version of what cataloging is. So we just wanted to share that with you. And um, over lunch, we'll have the poster that we did, uh, Martha's department and um, James' department did. We'll have them displayed so everyone can see them. Any questions? <laughs> All right. Now, next. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next, what I'm going to talk about is, um, well, an update on our pri priorities and processing turnaround times for cataloging requests. Currently, I'm the only one in the department. <laughs> so right now, in coding level updates, I'm archiving them, and we will get to them, but they aren't being processed right now. I've been focusing on making certain that every cataloging request that comes in is able to circulate. So if you're using connection, the minute I get to your request, if I notice that it's just an encoding level upgrade, I move it into the queue that it's supposed to be, and it will be done later. If you don't say that it's an encoding level upgrade, I then look at the pictures quickly and check workflows to see if it's circulating. If it isn't, I create a brief record, I get in the system, tell you that it's there, and then move on to the next thing. Um, with our non-connection libraries, uh, I try to process their tickets within seven days. So um, the ones that send images, right now I'm between five to seven days with them. And those that send physical items, I'm between five and seven days when they actually arrive here, not the day they send their tickets. <laughs> because I had one who submitted their tickets on September 3rd or 4th. And they just arrived at my office yesterday. So I was like, I, you're not jumping ahead of someone whose stuff has been here a couple of more days than that. So I do try to keep it very within a week for those items. But if you're a connection library, as soon as that ticket hits the desk, well, when I see it, <laughs> I try to make sure that you're circulating. That's why it's important that if you, um, found the record in OCLC, if you please import it and we'll fix it later because um, it's better for your, so that your patrons can start circulating the, or you can start circulating the items for your patrons. So that's the update on that. Any questions? Any online? All right, next what I'm going to show you is we made some changes to the, um, made some revisions to the cataloging request form. As you know, that can be found here. And um, according to our last uh, meeting, we uh, changed the top of the request form to say that 
cataloging requests may be submitted only for items owned by your library so that you're not submitting um, requests for items owned by other libraries. Uh, so that has been added. Also down here um, where it says uh, examples of uh, um, approved brief records. So if you notice under kits, we used to only have locally created kits there, but now it's just kits in general. And then we also added a few extra items to Realia and visual materials. This is according to things that have come into our help desk. Um, another thing we added down here, when you choose kit, if you look right after they ask all the other questions, one of the questions that is asked is, if your library receives an OCLC World Share Interlibrary Loan request for this kit, would you be willing to send it to the requesting library? If you aren't willing to send it, um, you choose no, and you're going to get an enhanced brief record in workflows. If you're willing to share it, to send it off to whoever may request it through WorldShare, then we'll, uh, we'll um, create a original record in OCLC. But if you aren't willing to send it, then there's no reason for there to be an OCLC record, so we'll just make an enhanced brief record for you, which is why all that information comes in handy so that we can create the best record possible. When I create them, I usually put subject headings in, I put as much information as I can possibly put in there for patron discovery. There's any questions about that? Also, <laughs> I forgot, there's one more thing. Um, let me get this shut here. Yeah. Um, yeah, there we go. In this area where it says about the measuring the books, we uh, put in a reminder that the length of the front cover is from top to the bottom of the item instead of, because we've, we've had some uh, people put in the width or the um, how thick the book is, they'll measure that or there's lots of different interesting ways people measure things. So we just wanted to put that reminder on the request form. All right. Now, according to what um, uh, Liza handed out for me, I'm going to show you guys where it's at online. Um, we're looking for the helpful hints for submitting cataloging requests cheat sheets which can be found at Workflows, Documentations, and Training, Cataloging, and Cheat Sheets. And right here, helpful hints for the RSA cataloging request form. So we'll be talking about that. Um, we, add, we did a little bit of editing for this, namely question number 10. I mean, number 10, <laughs> we put in there that um, if you are doing an encoding level upgrade or an encoding level record upgrade, uh, that you please attach to your item and import it. We just put that reminder in there because there isn't anywhere that says to do that. We suggest it to people who send in requests to make sure that their item, that their library is attached to the record and that they import it so that it can circulate. But some people don't do it, and then they're like, why hasn't anyone touched my ticket? Well, it's because we assume that you have brought the record in. Because we don't check everything that comes in because it would take way too much time. <laughs> so this is just a reminder to attach to the um, record and then import it before you submit your request. Uh, next. Number 14, we wanted to put a reminder in this that if we need more information about your request, that we will reach out to you via email or phone 
based on the information you give us in your request. Um, so please keep a look at. We generally try to change the title of the sub or the subject heading or the subject title when we email back. Usually, like please read or please respond or need more information. And we usually leave the cataloging request number, um, confirmation number in that he uh, heading. So please keep a watch out for those because if you don't respond to us via email or by phone, we will just close the ticket. Because we can only try so many times to get information from someone before it's a lost cause and it's time to move on. So we close those tickets without letting you know and just close it and it's out of the way. And if you still need that item cataloged, you're gonna to have to submit a new request. Also, um, 16, we added the reminder to always uh, edit your change me placeholders or we will delete them if they are there for more than 30 days. Um, I just ran this the other day and had to delete a few. And uh, it makes me sad because <laughs> I know those people send in requests and then they don't edit them and then the record goes goodbye. So please remember to edit your change me placeholders. That includes the call number, not, not just the item information. Because sometimes libraries will change everything but change me. It's like, but that's not where it is in your library. So you need to uh, edit that change me call number. And that is all I have on that. Does anyone have any questions? All right, um, I have a question. would like to know if anyone has any feedback on the cataloging request form or the whole procedure, how, how it works for you, what it doesn't work for you, anything at all? Because we want to make sure that it's working for you guys, not just us. You say you're not doing them right now with requests, is that correct? You want us to still send them in? Yes, okay. still send them. Send them, send them, send them. <laughs> we, we want you to keep sending them. That's, that's the whole point. We will get to them, and usually those encoding level upgrades, they don't take us that long. But right now, since I'm the only one here, and last, just for an example, last month we took in over 1,500 cataloging requests. Um, so far this month, I've done I've taken in over 600. We're only on day 12, right? <laughs> 13. Yeah, well, I haven't haven't looked at it. I haven't looked at it today, but as of yesterday when I left, I've taken over 600 cataloging requests so far this month. So I mean, there's only so much I can do in one day. So um, yeah, but. When Lisa gets back here and when we get when we hire the new person, things will quickly get back in order. It's just right now I'm slow. <laughs> and I apologize, but as I said, I'm only one person and I wish I was superhuman, but I'm not. So I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Anything else? There are a couple questions online let me um, i was receiving your question on there so let me from Carlette McComb. Um, she says it would be helpful to have a little box for placing the item ID. And sometimes she says she forgets to put it in the other comments box. She says obviously it would only apply to an instance where the item is already on workflow. Yeah, that's something
something we can consider. Um, it w it might even be helpful for a brief record cleanup because yeah, some libraries. I was thinking that question where it says is there a brief record? If we could add the item ID with that. Right, because that would imply it's already in there as well as an encoding level upgrade because technically, remember, if you're submitting an encoding level upgrade, then you should already have your item cataloged in there like, like Rhonda just said. So I think those are places where we could work item ID into the form where the submitter would need to provide it yet not cause confusion if it's something something um, not cataloged at all. We were coming up with a couple of ideas of where to put that item ID on the form. So thank you for the suggestion, Carla. That was the only suggestion I had online. All right, thank you. If you guys ever have any suggestions or comments or things you wish were there, uh, send us an email to the help desk and we'll find it, we'll get it, and try to take your suggestion and put it into work. And that is all I have for you right now. going to take us back to the RSA site. That way we can look at the next document. Um, we've been cataloging here at RSA um, off and on since I joined RSA about nine years ago. We've been cataloging electronic resources. Um, and we've gotten some requests recently that we suspected the records would not be good, the bibliographic records, because they're vendor provided, um, especially from one of our schools. Um, and this happened last spring. So we decided we really need a written policy about what we do with e-resource cataloging. Um, it can be time consuming. We know you want to provide access to your users. Um, through the RSA CAT to those electronic resources, but we need to figure out a better way to do this that is more sustainable than trying to load mark bibliographic records every time somebody purchases um, Follett or Mackin or um, I, I feel like in, in cases for the larger libraries, which we'll talk about, it, it's more justified. Um, but like I said, we've been getting requests recently to do more of this, so we decided it's time to have a written policy. Um, I'll ask Liza's help again. Yeah, you knew it was coming. <laughs> um, I thought what we would do is discuss this today, uh, let you think it over. If there's other staff at your library, um, your manager, other cataloging staff, if there's, um, if you have a staff member who specializes in e-resource support, um, I encourage you to share this policy with them because we want to make sure everybody understands what we're trying to do with this. Okay, so um, we're back here on our committee page. Um, right now, the only place where this policy is posted is right here under our meeting documents. We haven't officially approved it yet, so I don't want to post it on a cataloging policies page until we actually have it finalized. Um, the RSA board did look at an initial draft of this at their August 2nd users group, so this has been seen by the board, but the next step is for us to discuss it for us to approve it in January, ideally, and then we'll take it back to the board and the users group at the February 7th meeting. Um, so before we touch on um, key points of this document, um, I know I shared it Monday on the listserv, but I know everybody is busy and has lots of work to do besides this. So I wanted to ask first if anybody had a chance to look at this and if you have initial feedback on it. Was it kind of like 
you know, I don't know, it makes sense in theory, but we don't actually have anything right now where this might apply. I know um, with the board that was part of, I think the issue was um, the board, you know, was glad to see this, but I don't think it was, it was very easy to conceptualize how this fits into what they might be doing until they actually buy an e-resource. I shouldn't say buy, subscribe to an e-resource package. Okay, well, why don't we touch on highlights then? I won't read the whole document to you, um, but again, we'll, we'll start with discussion, and then if you could share this internally with appropriate staff at your library. If there's any feedback on it, feel free to call or email. Um, and then, like I said, we'll revisit this in January and, and get approval. Okay. Um, like I mentioned a couple minutes ago, um, this is in response. Like I said, we've had requests recently to be cataloging various e-resource subscriptions for various types and sizes of libraries, knowing that the quality of the records, um, the bibliographic records from the work we had done for them in the past, were not good. So we knew same vendor, probably not good quality records, trying to think of a more sustainable approach yet still make this content accessible in the RSA CAT like it should be for your users. Okay, um, I did put in boldface um, in the background section. Um, this is something I'm hoping at the end of the meeting I can tell you a little bit more about, but um, this policy, like I said, we'd like to move forward with approving it in the new year, um, but it is going to change a little bit because we're in the process of reworking membership levels and their associated fees with the RSA board. Um, that is a huge project because it's not just cataloging, it's circulation, it's system administration, it's reports, it's RSA CAT features. Um, so this, this document um, will be part of that rework, um, but like I said, in the meantime, we really need some kind of formal policy. Okay, um, some of these um, troubles, disadvantages with e-resource records, I've already hinted at or mentioned, um, but I've listed here some of the common complaints we have gotten about these records. Um, even though they do make the content searchable in the online catalog, um, We've heard that the placeholder call numbers and items, usually it's just a very generic, maybe it's like ebook as the call number. I know when Martha did the overdrive records, everything was an ebook call number. It had a dummy item attached. Those look like copies available to your patrons because they're used to seeing your print and your video recordings that list all those copies available on the item details page in the online catalog. So if you put an e-resource record in there with a dummy item attached to it, especially if multiple libraries subscribe to that particular e-resource package, they think there's lots of copies available of that e-resource. And it may be, depending on the license, um, restricting a certain number of users at one time, simultaneous users. So that's one reason we'd like to start getting away from these records when we can because of the confusion they can cause for your patrons. Um, we've heard too that sometimes the access links that are on the e-resource bibliographic record to the content, sometimes they don't link to the exact content that's described by the record. So it might link the user to a landing page to log in, and then they have to search within the e-resource for the particular content that the record is describing. Um, or it takes them to a site where it wants them to download an app um, in order to access the content. So again, we're, we're trying to get away from making this difficult for the user. Um, using these links that sometimes don't go to the place that they're expecting. Um, th this one is more of a problem um, on our end, but it, it can be a problem on your end too, because again, in the context of the user, um, we know that we have e-resource records right now in our database that we've loaded. They're very old. I'm sure people do not subscribe to them anymore because the content is probably outdated, not relevant. Um, so that's, that's one problem with these records. People de-license the packages, but don't necessarily tell us 
um, that they need these records deleted. So we still have them in the database, making it look like it's accessible to patrons. Um, sometimes the links change. Um, you might have a broken link. Um, again, we would need to know that here. Um, the cataloging team, because remember in workflows, except for some of the advanced cataloging libraries, nobody can change an access link on the bibliographic record. Um, remember, we protect bibliographic record edits um, since we've had what we call creative editing of records in the past, VHS to DVD and vice versa, things like that. Um, so if access links change, since we can't modify titles in workflows to, to change the access link, you need to be sure to submit it to us to change. And I know that doesn't always happen. Um, we have set this up for one library in particular, and it's causing a problem. Um, remember, Kendall showed several enhancements that were coming to the online catalog. We actually have made this custom profile for one of our members that has e-resource records where the access link for patrons to use, it displays on the result list in the online catalog. So they don't have to click to open the title. It's just right on the result list. That may be convenient, but it's breaking the functionality of the catalog, and they can't get things like those enhancements Kendall was describing. They won't be able to do the mobile design to make the online catalog responsive on a tablet or a phone. So some of these customizations we've done for members to make e-content more accessible, it's actually breaking their bigger online catalog. Um, this next one I've hinted at. So I've um, I've mentioned these records often come from vendors. Um, they may be in OCLC, but typically they're not. When you're buying a package, um, I shouldn't say buying, subscribing to a package, usually the vendor is eager to provide you records. They typically need a lot of work in order to make them meet our bibliographic standards. Um, and again, making sure that they display an index correctly. Um, one of our larger libraries, like it mentions here, we load e-resource records on a routine basis. It takes 67 steps for us to load the records. There's problems with encoding levels. There's a lot of problems with subject headings on them not being coded correctly. The access links don't indicate it's just for that specific library. And we're doing this in batch using a bibliographic utility. Um, so again, we recognize for our larger libraries, um, the ones paying the most in their membership fees, they will be able to continue this service if they need it, but we can't keep doing this for everybody who buys e-resource records. Um, this last one actually came up during the discussion with the board in August. Um, we do have a limit in workflows under our Circe Dynex contract as to how many bibliographic records we can have. We can have 1.5 million. Right now we're at 1.11 million. Um, so we have room to grow. Obviously though, we wanna focus on putting in your print, your AV. Um, we don't wanna clog up the database with lots of e-resource records because again, those count towards this limit. Um, if we need to raise this limit, that will cost more, obviously. Um, so like it says here, we're trying to prioritize remaining records and physical library materials when we can. Okay, any questions about the disadvantages? I know that wasn't the most positive <laughs> discussion. Okay, like I said though, for Big 13 libraries, we realize there's cases where this will still need to continue and we'll touch on that here again in a minute. Okay, um, so there's two different scenarios outlined in the next couple pages. Um, when we have what we call a non-Big 13 library request e-resource support, this section describes what we'll do. Notice I put a footnote at the bottom of one of these pages. Okay, page three. Um, this Big 13, like I mentioned just a minute ago, it, they pay $19,000 or more for their annual RSA membership fee. This is really that top tier of who's paying for RSA services. 
Um, after the $19,000, there's a drastic drop in what the next library is paying. Um, so I've listed the, the libraries here. Several of you are in the room or online. Um, but this section, though, we're talking about libraries that aren't one of those bigger ones. Um, so for those libraries, we're not going to be loading the MARC records um, on our end, and neither will the staff at the library. Um, we do, though, have a few options how we can make that content accessible for users in the RSA CAT in a more sustainable approach rather than those really yucky, confusing records. Um, we can do a few things, and these involve Kendall's expertise with editing RSA CAT profiles. Um, he can do things like put a link to the e-resource. Um, well, this is something the library would do, put a, put a link to the e-resource on the library website. Um, but this next one, um, he can put a link on your RSA CAT profile um, to the app from which you can search and download the content. He can create an e-resource room uh, where it has the link to the login portal. He can create an alert at the top of the RSA CAT page RSA CAT page that promotes the e-content. Um, I wanted to show you because we've done this for one of the schools, just so you can see how this would work. But again, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can still make users aware that you have this content, but we're trying to do it in a way that makes more sense than the MARC record. Okay, so notice here she's got a little link in the upper right hand corner for ebook downloads. Um, she's got a page over here. Um, she's got links to her ebook collections. If you click this link, um, it takes you back to that page. Um, there may be more enhancements we can do. Um, it seems like we're always making tweaks and, and learning new things about the catalog. So. I wanted to be sure and mention on the document, it's not an exhaustive list. Okay, any questions for the non-Big 13 before we move to the Big 13? Okay. Um, the first step when a Big 13 requests e-resource support, it's to try and see um, in Cersei Dynex's ERC, E electronic resource central platform if they have a connector port um, for that particular e-resource collection that the library subscribed to um, I've listed several things here but but basically it synchronizes between what you've purchased subscribed to from the vendor into the RSA cat and it provides metadata that describes the e-content it provides a lot of accessibility through the RSA CAT My Account, downloading, viewing checkouts, renewing, returning early. It shows availability from the result list. Um, so we're trying to use this ERC product, much like we're already doing for eRead Illinois, Baker and & Taylor, and Alliance Digital Media Library, ADML Overdrive. We're already using eResource Central to make that content accessible in our online catalog. So we're trying to do that more with some of these other e-resource packages our members are subscribing to. The thing to keep in mind, though, is if there's an ERC port for that particular e-resource package, it would be the responsibility of the library to help pay for it, um, the cost of configuring it and maintaining it. Because remember, you're the only library that has this e-resource package. So we're not setting this up system-wide for all of our members. Um, so we would have to work, work together um, in terms of cost to determine um, getting the ERC set up. And that's something that um, Kendall would work with Cersei Dynex and then the Big 13 library. Um, I don't know how many, um, but Cersei Dynex obviously can't work with every electronic resource provider. Um, they do have a document that lists the ones they're working with. I know Hoopla and BiblioBoard are two of them that we're looking at um, for configurations on a system level, um, but there's more than that. Um, but not every e-resource e vendor is able to be 
configured. Um, so we know in that case, like I've been mentioning, that we will have to look at MARC records. Um, I won't go into too much depth about that since we've talked so much about how they can be yucky. But, but basically, we need a sample of the records so that I can take a look at them, um, determine if they're going to meet our description, if they'll display correctly, if they'll index correctly. Um, if we take a look at those records and decide that they'll be able to be loaded, um, what I'll do is write up an internal procedure, and if they'll be loaded on an, on an ongoing basis, I'll have one of the members of my team do it for you on an, an ongoing basis. We're doing that for the normal public library for lynda.com, and it is working well. There may be cases, though, where the records are poorly created that it would take too much time to batch manipulate them, to make them workable in our database. So there are going to be cases, depending on what the records look like, where we're going to have to say we will not load them. Um, in that case, we would recommend those enhancements we talked about for the RSA CAT. Um, we can always do these enhancements, though, too, even if we do the MARC records. Um, I suppose even if it was in ERC, we could still do these enhancements. So um, some of these um, things we talked about can be used in tandem. Um, but the MARC records, like I said, it should really only be considered if there's no ERC option available. Um, and there will be no charge if we have to do the MARC cataloging support for a Big 13 library. Okay, any questions before we take a look at the last section? Is there anything online? Okay. Um, this last section, um, this I admit I added because of some questions I've gotten recently. So the board has not seen this section. Um, I think there would be general agreement, though. You would not want e-resources updated in OCLC WorldCat for a WorldShare request because, again, you probably have a restricted license just to your own patrons. Um, but I, I did put in here that we won't be updating holdings whether it's a Big 13 library or not, um, we, we won't be updating e-resource holdings in WorldCat, um, either in our batch updates or if we happen to be manually doing something. Okay. We're at the end of the document, so any questions just in general now that we've taken a look at it? Okay, does that sound like a good plan then for you to think it over, share it with other staff at your library who, who might um, need to be informed, and then we'll revisit this in January on the 10th for an approval. Okay, let's have a thumbs up or a hands up for those online if that sounds like a good idea. Okay, good. Let me just make a note of that so I remember what we're doing. Okay, I think we're in a good spot to take a 10 minute break. Um, why don't we try to convene at 11.05 um, and then we'll get started with the workflows cataloging. I'm going to stop the recording, but Rhonda, please help me remember to start it again. <laughs> we'll see you in about 10 minutes. There we go, and then we can collapse the red arrow. Oh, oh there we go. There, there we go. go. Okay. Okay. Go I think we'll go ahead and get started again. Um, we'll start next with the workflows cataloging part of the agenda, um, and we have some guest presenters, library presenters for this part. So um, we'll start with the new full current location. Did you start recording? We did. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> and I did on mute. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <I'm like> <laughs> Mini recording. Oh, are these my papers? Are we recording? And unmuted? We are. Thank you. We are recording. Let me see if it actually shows up here. Oh, there we go. Current location. I have some if, if, if you 
didn't. <laughs> Just in case. Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Jacobson Wood. Eric is passing out a handout based upon the new hold current location. I actually did not notice this myself. We have an awesome Cirque department at Alpha Park, and they notice everything. And one day they were looking for a DVD um, that they thought would be on the shelf, but then it said for current location, new hold. So they came and asked me, because I happened to be there, and I'm like, hmm, I have no idea what new hold means. <laughs> so I took a screenshot of the item, and you're seeing one of our items called Ghosted a Novel. And you can see over here, we're current location, it says new hold. I screenshotted that and sent it to RSA uh, for help. And Wendy kindly responded with an explanation. Basically, it sounds like, let's say you send an item out on a hold to a library. And the person doesn't pick up the item. But then somebody else from that same library also puts the item on hold it will show then the status of new hold. And that means it could still be at that library. It could be in transit. Um, it's also always good to look at your own shelf. Did I explain that right, Wendy? Okay. <laughs> a little, little more than that. Okay. So, it does not have to necessarily be an item that has been sent out of your library. Okay. Yeah, let's let Martha explain this because she understands the, the process a little better than I do. It I mean, a lot better. <laughs> it does not necessarily have to be an item that has been sent to another library. It can be something that is on hold at your library for your patron. The hold's expired. Um, we default at 10 days for holds to expire, but some libraries uh, have cho chosen to change that. So some libraries are like seven days, some are 10 days to, to expire. If the next person in the hold queue is your one of your patrons, when the clean hold shelf report runs, it changes that current location to new hold because somebody else there at your library is waiting for it. But then, like um, Jennifer was saying, it could also be something that was sent to another library when um, that hold expires because nobody has picked it up, you've not checked it out to one of your patrons, it's still sitting on your old shelf, that hold expires and the next person in the hold queue is also at that library, then it changes it to new hold at that time. Um, another um, situation that you could run into is that um, the item is sitting at your library for a hold. It's come to your library for a hold. The patron gets their um, notification that it's there for their hold and they decide they don't want it. So they go out into RSA CAT, they remove their hold, the next person is somebody at that library that wants it in the hold queue. Then when the clean hold shelf reports, it changes it to new hold because it's a new hold there at that that library. So. And I found... Is that, is that all of them that you can think of, Wendy? <laughs> yeah. All the scenarios. I found ours by going to item group editor and then for current location typing new hold. And I um, you have to make sure it's in all caps and all one word, the new hold. Otherwise, it won't find your items that might have a new hold current location. Or you can use the the uh, the gadget over there at the side and just select it from the list. Oh, okay. You have to type it in. When um, I was looking at it, I didn't think it showed up. Yeah, it should be on. Oh, okay. Um, the other, um, one of the other things about it is that um, if whoever is doing your clean hold shelf report, if they see that new hold on there, they need to go ahead and you know discharge the item so it activates the next one. If it never gets discharged and it just stays new hold, it's gonna stay new hold and it could stay new hold without any holds on it because it, you know, it's never got um, activated and, and um, the person hasn't got the hold and eventually it sits there and it shows no nobody has any holds. So. Anytime you see something with a new hole, just make sure you go out and discharge it. Do whatever workflow tells you to do with it. It may just tell you to put it back on the shelf at that point. So, okay. 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 Let's see. Oh, the next thing on the agenda is: Are you cataloging 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays? Um, this came up for me because I actually purchased the DVDs and Blu-rays for my library. 
And usually we would purchase the Blu-ray DVD combo packs if they weren't that much more than just the DVD by itself. But then I've noticed now sometimes on Amazon that they are also packaging with things the 4K. And apparently the 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays won't play on a regular Blu-ray player. And so then I was curious and I went into the catalog and just like a general search, I searched for 4K and I did come up with some libraries that it looked like they had them. And I think we could run into the same issue that we had when people at originally were circulating um, DVDs and then Blu-rays and you might have a patron that wanted the DVD, but the Blu-ray was also on the same record. And then the patron ended up with the Blu-ray and they didn't have a Blu-ray player. I was wondering if any of your libraries are knowingly buying 4Ks and if you're circulating them. Do you want to ch chime in, Liza, and then we'll have Katie go from more. And I know you said you were a no. Yeah, I, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, <laughs> no, we we don't have 4Ks and we're not purchasing 4Ks. Okay. And just because it's a book sale, is that? I don't think we just get any. You just don't buy them. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. How about it, Morton, for Katie? You noticed that the Marvel movies, the Blu-rays now come with the 4 k Yeah. So we've just been right. leaving them in the package and packaging them out with the blu ray So they oh. have the option if they have Okay. What might be happening with us is we get our stuff pre-processed by Baker and Taylor, not not Baker and Taylor, uh, Midwest Tapes. And they may be taking it out for us <laughs> if it was right because we already have them taking out the uh, digital copy if there's a digital shared disc. Okay. So that might be why we're not actually. I like your solution <laughs> for that um, to put them together in the same thing. I think we've got Thor and Avengers are the two, the only two we have right now, mm -hmm. and that seems to that ISBN number in the record for it. You can look for it. So right. So they're in the same case. Are you putting any kind of notice on it that there's a 4K one in there? Marking out that there's not a 4K in it, just those two DVD Blu-ray combo packs. Right. Mark out which one's not in there. So if they're looking for it, it's in there. That's the most elegant solution we've come up with. <laughs> okay. And you're assigning the Blu-ray item type yes. to it? Okay. Again, we've only got the two. You've only got right. two. Yeah. Does anybody know if their library is planning on purchasing and going ahead and, and doing 4K Blu-rays? Because so far, I think I've run into ones that seem like it's incidental, that maybe, you know, they were buying the Blu-ray combo pack and it came with it, so they've added it. But I haven't noticed enough within the system that it looks like anybody's making a concerted effort to actually buy them. I could find um, Doug here helped me with a report. Um, and we were laughing because if these records have been creatively cataloged in OCLC, what we use to try and query the report w won't be reliable. But what he did do, though, we could tell, um, and I'll read you a control number if you want to look it up in workflows, but we were using the 347 field, the digital file characteristics field, um, and we could see at least six different libraries attached to these um, HD records. Um, so I think we're going to need a new item type because I don't want the problem of what you were describing where it comes. Somebody thinks they can play it. They don't have the right device. Um, let me see if I can. You know what? Let's do it easy. So let's do a title search for hidden figures. Okay. And then let's limit the library to Marquette Heights MQ. Okay. I think this is another combo pack record, um, but if I remember right, it even has HD in the call number. Blue HID. Oh, that could be for hidden mm -hmm. figures, though. So. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> True. Let's go to the bibliographic tab now that we look at that again. Um, and it does say Blu-ray 4K Ultra Combo. For the edition. You just have a couple and you've kept them together, but um, we really need to stick with that best practice of putting these on separate bibliographic records because otherwise it's going to be too confusing for holds. Um, well, if you're if they're packaging if you're circulating them in the case, together is one barcode. Right. I suppose you can do just Blu-ray, but if anybody starts to circulate these separately, we need them on separate records. 
I think we'll need to revise our best practices because we mentioned blue rice, but we don't mention these specifically. Um, well, I, I did, uh, I'm buddy in here, but I did know, I have noticed that, you know, going to places like Walmart or something, uh -huh. time, and I do buy the Mario movies, I like that anymore they have the DVD separate by itself, and then they have the two Blu rays together. That's what I'm noticing too. They're not, yeah. they're not even packaging in there with the Blu rays and the DVDs together anymore for those. Okay. I go into the store to buy. Good. And I always wanted to buy them <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, we've counted on for our, we don't specifically for a lot of movies buy Blu-rays on their own. We just usually get it as this part of a combo pack because you get the second one for not very much more. And now they're separating them out. We have to reevaluate because our Blu-rays don't check out as well. But that's the the way the direction things are going. So it just means I'm going to have to spend more money. It's what I keep telling my boss. <laughs> yeah. This is really, um, from what you're saying, this sounds like then this is the way the combination packages are going. It's going to be blue way and, yeah, the, the 4K. I, I just, you can tell, though, I just don't want, if you're going to start circulating right. these separately, they've got to be on separate records for the patron experience. But it sounds like right now you're just going to code it as blue rice since they're going out together. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Oh. Well, and it is on the record, so you'll yeah. know you're getting it. And I'm wondering if manufacturers are moving towards pushing people more to Blu-ray because sometimes now I notice the Blu-ray combo packs are can be a little bit less mm -hmm. than the DVD for cost, especially on Amazon. So I'm wondering if they're kind of trying to get people to buy Blu-ray more and move on from DVD. Especially if there's an expensive device involved to, <laughs> to play the new yeah. Blu-ray format. I know. <laughs> okay, we may do some investigating. I think I may ask James to help me since he's the circulation and hold person. But um, I, I'd like to see because, like I said, there's six different libraries that we could see that have attached to these. And I'm wondering if they're doing what Morton described, where they're just circulating them together and considering it a Blu-ray, or if they're actually going to start trying to do these separately, because we'll want to know that in terms of making a new item type. OK. I think we're ready to move to the next item. And the next item is trouble caused by unchecked circulate box. Basically, this is another thing that search staff called me up to the front. I seem to always be there when there's a problem. <laughs> and they were checking out an item, and the person had it in hand. It looked fine. But when they went to go check it out, there was a pop-up that said they couldn't circulate it. And Robin, one of the, my excellent search people, has been there forever, and she'd never seen this happen before. So again, I took a screenshot, and I sent it to Rails, because they're great at troubleshooting this kind of stuff, um, to RSA. And basically, when probably at some point when it was cataloged, the circulate box had been unchecked. Let me see if, I, if my uh, screenshot had come up here yet. And that causes this pop up. Let's see, my computer. You can also run a report of this in Item Group Editor if you want to. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so it was this pop up that you can see on the screen or on the flyer. It says, Item may not be circulated. In the moment, I just told them, go ahead, and because I couldn't see anything wrong with the item. Uh, there looked like there was nothing weird about the record on my initial perusal. So I said, we'll go ahead and override it. I think it was just the regular RSA override. So then I sent that um, to RSA, and then they sent me back this showing that this little box right here that says circulate, if you click on it, it puts a check in it. And ours was not set to circulate. So then all I did was add the, the check mark in it. 
I'm not exactly sure how it got unchecked because when you catalog an item, ours just defaults to being circulate. So um, Erica ran a report for me, and we had, I think, one item. You didn't have many, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. Which, is, which was good because it's it, very mouse click. Yeah, it had to just be yeah. very mouse click. <laughs> the funny thing yeah. is, is yesterday I ran an item group editor report here to see if we had any items that said no to circulate. And I forgot to put it in Alpha Park, and it came up with 96,723 <laughs> yeah, items. This is a problem. And I was <laughs> lucky I did not crash the entire system. I was like, ah, my staff. Of I thought I did something really <laughs> wrong there. Your collection. Yeah. And I was going to be in big trouble. So apparently, I don't know if some people use that for something. Local history Local stuff. History. Yeah, technically you should have an item type. Yeah, because no ours are going to no hold rule, but people are unchecking it. Okay. For a local type material. I wonder about that because we just have ours mm -hmm. set for like reference materials that can't buy by their item type. I, I will say though, because earlier in the year I was talking to one of our smaller public libraries that has had a lot of director changes. They had close to 800 that were marked as non-circulating, and those were regular materials. So I know this is happening. Most likely a default was set in the call number and item maintenance wizard. So this is happening unintentionally, right. um, people not noticing it since it's a little checkbox that almost hides on the screen if you're not careful right. when you're cataloging. Yeah, good find, though. Well, I have We have one item, and I would say if you have things I think that are purposefully mark that and you wanted to run this report that you'd probably have to exclude some yeah item types and to not end up with a gigantic report things you don't need mm -hmm. we do have analytics reports too so if you like Doug's help running a non-circulating items report or <laughs> subscribing you to one that comes on a recurring basis he can do that too if this is a recurring problem at your library right okay so that was all. I think we're ready for Doug. Thank you, Jennifer, for pointing out the, we'll say it was a glitch. A glitch. <laughs> it was just one. We're ready for Doug to talk about some recent changes to the discard procedure. Oh, your notes. <laughs> it's weird looking on the Yeah, it's different. I missed a little arrow. There we go. So there's only minor changes. It may or may not even really affect what you do with using discard users if you use a discard user. Um, the I'm first. Show where it's posted on the screen for those online. Yes. Where it is. On the um, workflows documentation yes. training. There you go. And it is and under then the catalog. catalog. Okay. Even though it's technically not just cataloging. Yeah, <laughs> you made, enough, you right? made the form. And then um, cheat sheets. Oh, that's right. So, uh, you can tell how often I actually use this site. <laughs> and then a little bit further down. There you go. Okay. So in the cataloging cheat sheets, about two-thirds of the way down if <clears throat> you need another copy or if you lose the one you have. Um, multiple branches, of course, it might make sense to have one for each branch, and that's fine. Or if you have different departments doing weeding, you could have one for different departments. In general, though, I really prefer just one discard user per library. It makes life a lot easier on me, um, and it makes certain that we'll actually get all of your things discarded, because um, if you have more than one user, we have to run a completely different process uh, than we use for single discard users. Um, 
So if you want to use multiple disk card users, maybe talk to us first, I'd say, um, unless it's one of those circumstances that I just mentioned with the different departments, because um, we get a report every month of the new disk card users. So um, in a perfect world, we'll see it and then set it up. Although I have two disk card user libraries that don't have a disk card thing running at the moment. So. Um, so the big thing is probably with checking items out to discard for lost items. If you're building a user, you need to make sure you build the user manually first because when you check an item out to discard, it's like a checkout. So it assumes the item's not lost anymore. So if you are wanting to bill a user for a lost item, create that bill before checking the item out to uh, your discard user because it works just like as far as the computer knows it's just another user so obviously you can't check out an item that's not in front of you but it doesn't know that they're all going to be uh, deleted uh, let's see oh and there's there's a, a link on the fourth page in the bullet point that's about that for instructions on how to add manual fills you don't know how to do that Oh, sorry. oh, I forgot about that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they run between the second and the fifth. They're spread out to reduce strain on the system. Um, and it, when we first started doing it, they would just delete things that were checked out to the discard users in the previous month. Uh, but now they check out everything through the end of the previous month. So anything older than that, if for some reason there's something left on there, um, all the way to the end of the previous month when they run, they will. We'll blow those away. Were there any questions online about the revised discard? Anything here? Anything? Like I said, they're, they're minor changes. There'll probably be more interest this afternoon to the CERC people, um, but I wanted to give everybody the, the info on it. So. All right, well, if you have questions about discard users, send an email to the help desk. Of course, if you have them while you're here today, you can just come bug me. But, uh, yeah. Thank you, Doug. Sure. Okay. The next thing I wanted to show you, this is something we've not put in our five workflows that you use every day for cataloging and circulation. Um, this is something we've put in the training server. So let's see if I can pick the right color. Uh, we have space in the result list display in workflows. We have space for one more column. And that column can pull information from the bibliographic record. So we were trying to think, this was back in June, what might be helpful to pull from the bibliographic record that would make it on the result list, somewhat easier to see the format of items. Um, remember we talked about the 347 field in the context of digital file characteristics for those 4K Ultra HD Blu-rays? Um, so we've configured a digital file column display, and I wanted to show it to you to see what you think. Okay, um, digital file details, this is a column we've added. Um, remember, you can drag these columns to move them around. If it's under, is it 500? I always forget the sorting limit, but you can sometimes, maybe not by this one. I feel like you're supposed to be able to sort by these. Can sort. Yeah. Maybe not this one. <laughs> that would have been nice, though. Um, so there's a, a few things to note about this for books, your volumes. It's not going to display any digital file details because this is a non-print field. Um, the resource description and access, the RDA records that use those cataloging rules um, that they implemented, I feel like it's been six or seven years now. They, they've been in existence a while. Um, but those RDA records and hybrid records, if they have some of the RDA rules, 
These are going to have the digital file details. The older bibliographic records that use older catalog rules, they won't have the 347. Um, but if I'm on the bibliographic screen right here, it's, it's pulling from that digital file details 347. We have it pulling from subfield B because that typically tells you DVD, Blu-ray. Um, notice it says things like Xbox and PlayStation, Wii. Um, so the results are inconsistent, I know, um, but I I do think this is worth looking at because, again, it, it does give you from this result list display a quick peek of what the specific um, format details are. Um, my other thought, and this was something um, we'll touch on at the very end, but um, remember we've been talking about for several years Markive, that service that enriches records. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but I did add it to my list because we've talked about hybridizing records to have RDA elements. And if the 347 could be added as part of that archive processing, that would make these results even more consistent for older records that don't have that 347 still. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So Martha asked for those online if the 347 is repeatable. Yes, I've actually got a whole um, little list of things to consider, and that's one of them. Um, let me pull up an example here of what you're talking about, because if it has multiple 347s, it's only going to display the first one. So, of course, I asked our sure sailing Thursday Dynex consultant if we could change that, and she said, no, because that is architecture of the database that cannot be changed, is what I was told. So here's an example where um, Harry Potter channeling Kendall, since this is his favorite hmm. title. Um, notice it has two 347s, and the first one, which is what this display would pull from, it doesn't have a subfield B. So let me show you how that would look if if we did a title search, it basically would have nothing. That might be enough to get me where I need to be. Um, remember that the last four digits of the OCLC control number are 8835. Okay, here we go, right here at the bottom, 8835, the 2016 results. It's it's blank because that first 347 didn't have a subfield B. Um, if it did have a subfield B, let's say it was a Blu-ray HD combo pack, um, and the first 347 had the just regular Blu-ray, that would display here. It would not display something like Blu-ray semicolon HD, which is what I asked about, and they were told no because of the architecture. Um, it would just display the, the first instance of the 347B, but it, remember if the 347B isn't there at all, like this one, it's just blank. Um, so that's one downside. Um, well, that actually is, is the next one I was going to show you. It, it ties into those combo packs. Let me do a different control number here. Eight, six, one, two, six, oops, eight, six. Let's see if I type that right. Okay. Um, this one is for Washington. Um, so again, there's two, three, forty-seven. This is what we were just describing. The first one says Blu-ray. Second one says DVD. So take a look at that. Pacific Rim, where are you? Yeah, so see, it's just displaying the Blu-ray since that was the first one. So there's some downsides to it. Um, yeah, and here it is again, those two, three, forty-seven. So. Um, those two things where it's blank or it has two, um, and then knowing we can't configure both of them to display in the result list, it's just the first one. Um, 
So keeping those things in mind, any feedback you're willing to share about this? Do you think it'd be helpful? Do you think it's too incomplete? It wouldn't be very helpful? Since it's from that one, that's the first one. I mean, I don't know, could it be bringing back incorrect information? I think it's coded correctly on the record. That, on the record. It's the first one. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if, if the record is coded wrong, creatively cataloged, then okay. yeah, it's, it's going to display the, the wrong value. Yeah. Um, the other thing, though, I wanted to mention, remember, we, we just talked about the best practice is if you're barcoding these separately, um, to have them on separate bibliographic records. So technically, if, if these this combo pack is being circulated, the best practice is to have, um, you know, they're, they're on separate records, um, one for the Blu-ray, one for the DVD. And then if you were on separate records that just describe that format of disk, it would only have one 347, and then the digital file details would work great because there's just one 347 with the B correctly coded. So. Um, you know, it, it kind of works in tandem with what we're trying to do in terms of getting members to split up those combo sets. Um, yeah, any other feedback about this? Is there anything online about this? I think generally non-cataloging staff would find it a lot easier for the ones that do display. Sure. Because, you know. DVD or Blu-ray is a lot more intuitive than video disc. <laughs> yeah. Where they have to go into the it is graphic record. Right? Yeah. yeah. I do think if we implemented this, I'm not sure of our next step. Okay, good. M Melissa at Quincy says it'd be helpful because she does the ordering for AV, the collection development. Um, I do think if we implemented this, and I think there needs to be obviously more steps with other groups looking at this, but since we're catalogers, I thought, let's share it here first. Um, I think, though, if we implemented this, we would definitely have a little document that has these two downsides that I talked about, because you would want to know that it only looks at the first instance, or if it doesn't have a subfield B in the first instance, it, it doesn't display anything. Um, but if it sounds like this would be helpful for staff um, doing collection development and just public services type work. Okay, yeah, let me move it forward with um, Kendall and see what he thinks our next steps are. Um, and then, like I said, if we implement, I'm sure there'll be a listserv post and we can do a document with downsides. <coughs> okay. Um, the next thing on the agenda, I feel like it was a summer of broken things, <laughs> and this is one of the things that is, it's, it's partially fixed, but it's part of it is still broken. Um, remember, we have an item category three script that runs each Sunday morning at 6 a.m., and it looks based off of the item type to make sure you've correctly coded the category three. It also is supposed to do certain things for large print, braille, and government documents. Um, in, in both of the libraries that noticed the trouble with this, you're in this meeting, so thank you. Um, Quincy, mm -hmm. Melissa, and Elizabeth at Henry both noticed this trouble, so thank you for reporting it. Um, and I know Wendy took a first stab at it, so thank you too for, for trying to look at this. Um, for some reason, the large print part of the script, it broke in early June, and the lines of the code were completely missing from what was running on our server. I suspect it might have had something to do, but we did this in January um, when we moved our server from being locally hosted to cloud hosted, but I don't know why the problem would have just started in June, but it's awful funny that that was being discussed. Um, that server migration when we were talking about the code being missing from this. Um, so the, the, the good news is um, the large print part of that script is fixed. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple examples in the live database of what's broken so you at least know. Um, 
but the plan is for the large print part of the script um, to start running again this Sunday and it'll run each Sunday morning. Um, the part that isn't working is the government documents, but to me that part we can fix. It's not as crucial as large print. Um, it looks like the Braille part is still working as well. Um, another thank you to Quincy, Melissa, because we were working with some Braille bibliographic records in her collection, um, and those have been successfully coded when we ran this new script. So th the Braille, I think, is good. The large print, I think, is good. So let's take a couple examples of what's broken, just to make sure we understand what will be fixed. Oops, I wanted item ID. Okay. Did anybody else notice this was broken and you were just being diplomatic and didn't tell us? Okay. No, I think I I mentioned it at some point. I remember the large print one. I don't I don't think it was June. I think it was before that, but so well, hopefully, yeah, if you still have that item, um, you, you oh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> I was going to say you can check it. Um, we're looking for the script, um, this reproduction field D for large print, and then remember if it's over 18 centimeters, we're considering it a true large print. Um, this one's 25. So notice here, um, Pekin's book, your code in his book. Um, but here in our test server, where we've run the new version of the script, I wanted to assure you that it is corrected. Very slow. Sorry about that. Um, in a way, I don't want to say this was good, that this broke, um, but when I was troubleshooting it with Cersei Dynex, um, I noticed that we hadn't, and this is completely um, a, a shortfall on my end, but I hadn't taken into consideration when we first started doing large print conversions. There's records, just like you see when you're cataloging, where they have subfield C with the size, but it's blank or it's missing entirely. So those we want coded as large print because they're still coded as large print in the fixed field up at the top, but it was making those books. So in a way it was good because I hadn't considered those ones where the size wasn't correctly entered. Um, so now we, we can take care of that as well. But notice here the, the same peak and item in the test server where the corrected script ran. It's, it's large print. So, like I said, we'll restart this on Sunday and hopefully um, the, the code won't disappear again. Um, the government document part, like I said, that part isn't working, but um, there's very few, um, I don't want to say there's very few, but um, it to me it's just not as much of a crisis as fixing as the, the large print. So let me show you an example of one that should be government document, but it's not. Um, we're looking at, when we're trying to identify government documents, we're looking at the fixed field value, this government pub. There's several values here, S for state, F for federal are two of the, the more important ones. Notice here, here's Shanoa's book in our live database. It's coded as the book category three. So this technically should be government doc. Um, notice though, McLean County history, they're using government doc as the item type and the category three is gov doc. So we know that part of the script is working where it just does a straight item type to item category three mapping. It's when it starts to look at these fixed fields, it, it starts to have trouble. So that one will get fixed, but like I said, large print to me is, is more important to get fixed since it's affecting more of your collections. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. Um, this next one is what I like to call a quick hitter. Um, I printed, this might be the last document. Okay. Um, yeah. 
Um, this came up actually just in the past couple weeks. This was um, reported by the Normal Library, and we had Quincy help us resolve this. Um, I revised the delete cheat sheet um, because there's several errors you can see when you're deleting items. So I've put on the last page what some of these more common errors are, and we had one, like I said, just in the past couple weeks I added here. Thank you. If you're trying to do a delete in the delete titles wizard and you see title on order cannot remove, you'll need to click OK to close the warning. Um, what's happening is, um, right now it's, it's just Quincy. They're using the acquisitions module and they've placed an order on the same bibliographic record that your item is attached to that you're trying to delete. Their order is considered open because they haven't received or loaded it yet. Like it says here, if the, the order is open, workflows won't let you delete the item. So what we need to do is um, send your barcode and your title to our help desk. I'll work with Melissa at Quincy. Um, they'll do some tweaks on their end just so you can delete your item, and then they'll switch back what they need to in their open order. So it's, it's a little bit of a back and forth. Um, I'm hoping you won't see this often. Quincy, remember, joined us February 2017? Yeah, okay. Um, and this is the first time I've heard about this, so I'm hoping this isn't happening a lot. Um, but we can do a back and forth so you can delete your item. Any questions about that? Okay, um, this is another quick hitter. I know most of you in the room have changed your cataloging account PIN, but if you haven't, um, th the guide for your cataloging account, I didn't print it because it's a longer document, um, but it's posted here on our guides page. We have an extra step now if you need to change your cataloger account PIN. This is something else that Again, Kendall says it's an enhancement. I feel I feel like it was broken, but either way, it was just it was just one more thing to figure out. Um, when you're changing your PIN in the RSA CAT for your cataloger account, remember you go to this change PIN screen once you're logged in. Now, when you get to that screen, um, you need to delete what it has as the current PIN and you need to type in all caps what your PIN currently is. When your account's set up, remember it's cataloger. Um, but what you don't wanna do is just go with the PIN, it's automatically filled in for you. In current PIN, you need to delete it and retype it. Then you can enter your new PIN twice. If you go with what it auto-filled for you in current PIN, it won't let you change the PIN because it's become sensitive now to uppercase, lowercase. So you'll need to have your caps lock key on when you're entering your current PIN or else it won't change it. This in a way is an enhancement because it's greater security for the PIN. Um, but on the other hand, everybody's used to just going with what's there, keeping it in lowercase, workflows automatically puts it in uppercase. But now um, because of this enhancement that was done, it, it wants it in uppercase in order for you to change it. Okay, any questions about that? If that doesn't work for you, let me know because I'm still not convinced this is the, <laughs> it seems to work, um, but I'm still not convinced this is the, the solution. Okay. Um, I have a collection, tidy collection tip I wanted to share with you. And this actually was um, a report request that Carla and McComb asked for, and I think it's a, a good question. Um, how many of you have gotten a Pipe Z report before? Okay, the Pipe Z, remember, is that little analytic in a call number where it's usually used for a multi-volume set or a multi-disc set so that when the patron puts the hold in the RSA cat, they can pick the specific volume or disc they want. Um, what we did though with this report, um, based on Carla's suggestion of 
trying to find these and, and do cleanup, um, we've added the 300 field where it says the page numbers and the size. I think I'll show you Alpha Parks. Um, so at first it looks overwhelming, but there's a couple things you can do to try and find these. So I always like to sort the report, and this again might depend on your workflow, um, but I like to sort the report first. I think I'm gonna do it by the 300 field. And then I'm gonna group together everything in the 300 fields that are on the same OCLC records. We'll see how this looks. Okay, so if it's missing in its 300 column, that means it's it's probably kind of a strange record, but that's that's a different problem. Mm -hmm. We won't, or it could be a brief record. We won't go into that right now. Um, but what you're interested in, once you sort it by 300 and then control number, these records here, they clearly describe just single items. I mean, look, they have page numbers. It doesn't say like these do. There's five volumes. A lot of these are correct. They're multiple volumes. But like this one, it's just one sound disk. You really should take the pipe Z out of those call numbers because they're not needed in workflows. But I know sometimes workflows put them in for you automatically. So we have to be able to, to solve that problem too. Um, but notice here on the bibliographic tab, again, just what we saw in the report, this is clearly one sound disk. It doesn't need the pipe Z, but Workflows is putting it in because it sees that um, caption prefix, the V there. So I went ahead and put the underscore. That way it won't cause a place hold box where there doesn't need to be one in the online catalog. And um, we actually had, I think Nancy at Galesburg asked about this a couple years ago. Yeah, Wendy? So is that underscore the only solution? Because I know Washington had one recently that won't let them change because of the word winter. Oh yeah, sure. It thinks that the thing in there. Yeah. yeah, the underscores. Yeah, that's the best solution. It doesn't hurt anything in the display um, here or in the online catalog. Um, ideally, it would be nice um, to have separate class schemes set up where the pipe Z is configured differently. But to me, um, since the underscore doesn't hurt anything, we'll we'll use that approach for now. Um, but yes, yeah, so you just don't want that placeholder box appearing where it's on a single item record. Yeah. Okay, so if you want this report, feel free to email James at the help desk. Don't ask for this more than quarterly though, because he manually runs it, like the bad barcode report. Um, otherwise, we'll fill his day with running pipe Z and bad barcode reports. So you're welcome to, to get this report and do some cleanup if you have time. Um, but again, let's make it a quarterly frequency for how often you suggest it. Okay. We're going to switch gears and we'll cover um, some OCLC topics. She said I didn't have to do it anymore. It was her last one, and she didn't say it was my last one. <laughs> Actually, before we move on to the OCLC uh, cataloging, um, we want to ask you if you have any ideas for future tips. Um, you don't have to shout them out right now. You can send suggestions to the help desk um, or call us and let us know. Or we would also. It would be great if you guys come up with hints or tips that you use on a daily basis that you don't think other people know and you'd like to share them. So we would happily let you share such tips with your fellow catalogers. So if that's, anyone want to say anything now? Anything online? All right. <laughs> No. That's okay. Um, since we're kind of short on time, I'm just going to do a brief uh, overview of what I just sent after I show you where you can find it on our website. Okay, what we're going to talk about is search strategies for DVDs and Blu-rays and OCLC connection client 
as well as um, we have a help uh, tip sheet on um, how to identify them on a record. And so we're gonna, you'll find these documents in OCLC training documentation under connection, under connection client. It's kind of far down. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the first one we were talking about, I was matching an OCLC record to your video or sound recording. There is a document that, that helps you with that. And uh, it was revised back in June. So that's there. And then also, the search strategies for DVDs and Blu-rays and OCLC connection clients. That's what we're going to talk about right now. And um, really, because this document has everything in it, I was going to do a live demonstration, but we really don't have time. Which one does it? Might actually save it for next time, but yeah, let's still give an overview. Yeah. Uh, the first thing we want to suggest is that you change your default batch search. Um, I'm sure most people use ISBN as their default batch search, but we would like to suggest that you change it to standard number. Um, standard number will also search for ISBNs. I use it on a daily basis. I don't use batch searching. I use a different search strategy, but I use standard number to search ISBNs. I use it to search for UPCs. I use it to search for uh, publisher numbers, um, for those uh, numbers that are on disks that'll say, like, for example, SF18157, that stands for Shout Factory and their catalog number for their item. Um, then some, like HBO, will have a long string of numbers on there that identifies that particular disk. So using standard number will help search better for video recordings. Also, this document, um, we want to remind you to apply your uh, default WorldCat qualifiers. And we, um, this document tells you how to do that. Once you do it, it should stay in, uh, stay there every time you go in to use it from there on, unless your uh, OCLC corrupt online file corrupts or something. That happens sometimes. Um, also, all these uh, search strategies that are dis uh, discussed in this document can be used using um, the command line right there at the top of your OCLC connection client, or it can be used in the search, which you can find using that, or they can be used in your batch. So one of the things you can search for is the UPC, and we give you an example of a UPC right there and what you would enter. You would enter that whole number starting from zero to zero, uh, not just the numbers within the lines, but the numbers outside the line too. So it would be that whole number. And see, it shows you how you would enter it in and it shows you what the search string would look like. Here's the publisher number I was talking about. You can see that on the on the item. Also, if you notice, there's UPC on this item too. So you could search by that. If you look, see there's the searching for those. It tells you how to search for just that. Then also reminding you that you can search by title and DVD format.
for Tidal and Blu-ray format. As I said, each, each of these gives you examples in the document showing you how to do it so that you can do it on your own. Does anyone have any questions about this? Yes? What's the code MN stand for? Is it music number? Music number. Music number. Good call. Yeah, that was Tracy. The question was, what does MN stand for? And it stands for music number or manufacturer number. Thank you, Melissa. Actually, I think that's it. I think it might be manufacturer number. Yeah. Yeah. You just think music number because you use it on CD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like I yeah, I think manufacturer makes sense, though. Yeah. But as I said, you could put that number in under standard number, and it would work without having to use that MN. Yeah, if you use, if you leave your default as standard number, you can search those numbers. I do it frequently. <laughs> Does anyone else have any um, tips or hints that they use to search for? video recordings or sound recordings? Sometimes I also do add in the keyword and put like the main act, one of the main actors in case it's something that has a lot of different versions. Okay. So I, it just seems I get less yeah. Change results. Yeah. Totally understand that. <laughs> See that quite frequently too. Um, I wanted to also point out on the first document I pointed to but didn't show, it does give you a better idea of what match points to look for when you're searching on these records, especially for your Blu-rays and DVDs. You definitely want to look at your 300 field to make sure that you're looking at a record for one item, for one disc, or multiple discs. You want to look at your 347, which says if it's a DVD or a Blu-ray, um, and also the 538 will tell you if it's a DVD or a Blu-ray. There are other examples, but those are the three top ones. Okay, if no one has any questions, I'm going to be done. Thank you. Okay, so in true Erica fashion, we will cover a few of these items next meeting. I think we did this last meeting with the RSA CAT update. We covered that today. We were going to do last time. So thank you, Liza, for having some things ready. Would you be willing to do it in January? Sure, as long as I keep my document so I remember what I was going to okay, say. Okay, perfect. Yeah, we'll have Liza do some ALA highlights. I did give you the supervisor's report, remember earlier when we talked about webinars, so um, take a look at that. It has new codes, membership changes. Um, I put priorities for our department here internally because I know there's a lot going on and I wanted to keep you guys informed about what our current and our back burner priorities are, so I put that in the document. Um, we'll convene though, thank you for Adjourn, I should say. We'll, we'll adjourn. Um, we're two minutes over, but thank you everybody for staying. Um, and we hope to see you January 10th, 2019, with your snowsuit on. <laughs> thank you again for coming. It always sounds so far away, but then, and then suddenly it's yeah. January. Yeah.